It's America's iconic crop. It grows bigger and faster than any other grain in the world. Without it, the Aztecs, the Pilgrims, and the state of Iowa might not exist. And maybe we wouldn't either. There's so much you didn't know about corn, it will blow your mind. So let's find out how this crop works. Corn is the single most productive crop on the planet. Nothing, I mean, nothing grows as well as corn. You can't get the biomass, the yield of any other grain or, or vegetable product compared with corn. This ordinary seeming plant can be turned into everything from plastics to gasoline. It's a brilliant plant in its adaptability. It's used so profusely in so many products in so many ways. I'm not sure we could live any longer if we lost corn. And corn is us. Up to 70% of the carbon in our bodies comes from this single incredible plant. But the kind of corn that makes up most of the U.S. harvest has a bizarre secret. One that will shock you. Ninety-nine percent of the U.S. corn crop is a type called dent corn, named for the little dent in each kernel. So why is this one type so dominant? Because no other food crop on Earth produces so much so fast. We are now up to close to 200 bushels of corn per acre. It's an amazing amount of food. Five tons of food from one acre of land. It's an incredible achievement. It's true. But even though it's the biggest crop in the country, and maybe the world, raw dent corn is pretty much impossible for humans to eat. They're growing inedible crops in a certain sense. I mean, they've got to be processed first. That's because the outer shell is too hard for our bodies to digest. In fact, to make dent corn edible, it either has to be ground into flour or soaked in a highly corrosive alkaline substance called lye, the same chemical used to tan leather. But corn still makes up a huge percentage of all the calories we consume. Dent corn finds its way into everything from chips to ice cream to toothpaste. We wouldn't be here if it wasn't for corn. You know, corn is a lifeline. To keep up with the world's demand for corn, American farmers grew a staggering 93.6 million acres last year. That's more than enough cornfields to cover every square inch of Iowa and Illinois combined. And every kernel from every ear of every stalk is loaded with corn's secret ingredient, a complex energy-packed molecule called starch. Corn is made up of three key components, the germ, pericarp, and endosperm. One part contains the living genetic material of the plants where the DNA is, and that's what allows it to grow. Then around that is really a bunch of energy, which we would call starch. It's actually a solar power cell that turns the energy from the sun and takes in CO2 and turns it all into food or chemical energy. It really is just this, this packet of carbohydrate. Pound for pound, carbohydrates contain more energy than dynamite. Extracting that energy is the trick. Animal cells like ours do it by transforming the starch into a sugar called glucose, the main fuel source for every cell in our bodies. Glucose is sort of the building block of all life. But corn hasn't always provided us such an amazing source of energy. It's had to evolve. Everyone knows what corn looks like. As tall as a grown man, bright green, giant juicy cobs covered in golden kernels. And we all know where corn grows too, the Midwest. Well, it turns out neither one is really true. In fact, to find real corn, you need to go to central Mexico. The ancestor of corn is this uh, little branched grass in, in Mexico called teacinte. That's right, corn isn't a vegetable, it's a grass. And the cobs of that original plant are just slightly larger than a quarter, certainly not big enough for a meal. So how did this stubby little Central American grass turn into the giant green monster that crowds the fields of Iowa? People. This is a product of, of 10,000 years of domestication and now breeding to get this plant. 
which is tall and produces these large ears of seeds. The man-made work of improving corn is still going on at Iowa State University, Ames, Iowa. And the pressure is on. Corn producers want to increase yields by 6% every five years. Luckily, corn is ready-made for selective breeding. It's a perfect plant. It's got both male and female flowers, and so it's the easiest plant to manipulate. We can take the pollen from another corn plant and mix it with the, the female parts and essentially take the best traits from two plants. One parent grows well in tight rows. The other produces large ears. Crossbreed them, and you might get a hybrid capable of generating more corn per acre. So right now, yields are going up in Iowa at about the rate of about two bushels per acre per year. Getting the corn plants to crossbreed may be easy, but finding a breakthrough hybrid requires a lot of trial and error. Like creating a new drug, breeding new corn varieties can take years of work and cost a fortune. The hybrid seeds that a farmer plants has millions of dollars of research behind it. And our symbiotic relationship with corn doesn't end in the breeding lab. Getting the man-made corn to grow isn't just a matter of scattering some seeds and hoping for the best. You pay for everyone, you won't plant everyone. Just getting the seeds in the ground is a roll of the dice. There's an old saying, you don't have to go to Vegas to gamble. You can do it by becoming a farmer. We have normally a narrow window due to weather concerns to get our crop planted. But it's not just the seeds themselves that are carefully designed by man. It's also how they're planted. In the wild, seeds are dispersed by winds or animals. On a corn farm, they're dispersed by high-tech equipment. Each one of these diesel-powered beasts pull planters some 60 feet wide and capable of spitting out 32,000 seeds per acre. If you calculate that, that comes out to about one seed every six inches. I'm checking my spacing right now. Apparently, we very close to six. Because every inch matters, some farmers even employ satellites 12,000 miles above the fields to guide their machines. By using GPS to plant and then coming back to do all the subsequent tillage and maintenance operations, we're able to follow the same track and we never damage the crop. But to really blast off, corn needs a turbocharger. In this case, nitrogen-rich fertilizer. Nitrogen powers the creation of basic building blocks, amino acids, and cell membranes. But the soil alone can't supply enough of it, so farmers use fertilizer to increase their yields. It takes an immense amount of fertilizer, like between 100 and 200 pounds an acre, because corn is a very greedy plant. The process of making all that fertilizer causes two problems. It consumes fossil fuel and creates pollution. We use the chemical nitrogen that is derived from natural gas, from fossil fuel, and the corn only absorbs some of it and the rest of it runs out into the water supply. Nitrogen fertilizer washes from the cornfields of the Midwest into the Mississippi River and eventually into the Gulf of Mexico. There, it's blamed for depleting the water of oxygen and killing marine life. But when applied to a field of corn, the nitrogen supercharges the plant's finely tuned genetic machinery and it goes to work. Once the shoot breaks ground, the first thing that it does is starts producing leaves. That plant keeps growing taller and keeps producing more leaves. 21 weeks later, the corn will stand six feet tall, and every acre will pack enough energy to feed 1,687 people dinner. So it seems that the experiment, begun more than 10,000 years ago, has definitely been a success and given us our most productive man-made crop. Hard rock oil drilling, 
one of the toughest jobs around. There's a lot of moving parts. There's chains, there's pipe, there's a lot of things moving around. So you know you have to know what you're doing. So what does this brutal job have to do with a juicy ear of corn? It's all about a secret ingredient called drilling fluids. Extremely important part of the drilling operation. You couldn't drill the well if you didn't have the drilling fluids. And you can't have the drilling fluids without corn. That's because corn is the basic engine behind a vital ingredient for oil drilling called xanthan gum. It helps crews make strikes and even stay alive. But just how does corn do all that? With a little help from a bacteria called xanthanomus. In the wild, the xanthanomus bacteria causes broccoli and cabbage to rot. But in the 1950s, a USDA chemist made the unlikely discovery that mixing the bacteria with the sugar derived from corn created an incredibly useful biopolymer called xanthan gum. Xanthan gum loves water. So whenever it comes in contact with water, it immediately wants to hold that and take care of it. Basically, it turns ordinary water into a kind of slime, slippery but viscous. And that's what makes it so useful for so many products. In short, it's a naturally occurring thickener. Xanthan gum is born in Okmulgee, Oklahoma. And it all begins with corn. Or corn syrup. The syrup is a kind of liquid cornstarch, sweet, viscous, and loaded with energy. It's used in sodas and syrup and sweeteners. And it's the ideal food for xanthanomus. At CP Kelco's 95-acre facility, fully loaded 100-ton rail cars pull into the yard every week. Each sealed car contains 20,000 gallons of corn syrup. It takes about six hours from the pumping station to pump it over into a holding tank. From there, chemists inside the plant's lab inoculate the corn syrup with the xanthanomus bacteria and start to mix. The agitator is like a big shaker table. The agitation causes friction, and then the warmth of the room causes the bacteria to begin to grow. In this sugary environment, bacteria replicates fast. One bacterium cell can spawn 100 trillion identical cells in just 48 hours. From a little tiny, tiny amount of stuff and turns into 40,000 gallons. <laughs> After a few days, the bacteria has consumed the carbohydrates in the corn and excreted a gooey residue, xanthan gum, ideal for a variety of commercial uses. Xanthan gum is used where they want to have a uniform suspension. It goes into applications where water needs to be controlled so that when your toothpaste is squeezed out, it doesn't run out of the tube, but it's actually squeezed out onto your toothbrush. But what is it about this corn-powered slime that's so vital to hard rock oil drilling? It turns out that xanthan gum has a unique ability to lubricate and suspend rugged materials deep underground, properties that are key to the roughnecks working the drill. If you can imagine when you're trying to drill an original hole, there are a lot of particulates, a lot of rocks, a lot of dirt, things that we don't want to have included in the end product being oil. The benefit of the xanthan gum is it allows it to suspend the particles as you're drilling that hole to clean out the hole so that you get a uniformity drilling zone. Keeping a hole uniform doesn't just make drilling easier. It helps prevent deadly accidents called blowouts. You're punching a hole into an area that's going to come out. It's like punching a hole in a balloon. but it's in the ground, so the pressure's squeezed out and it comes out this hole. So any little spark, it'll ignite and catch on fire. But by keeping debris from falling back down the hole and sealing the shaft from the outside air, xanthan gum makes it possible to drill safely in dangerous environments. Well, without it, I don't think that we would be able to make it to work. That sums it up for me. The U.S. corn harvest is the Super Bowl of farming. The sheer scale of it is staggering. We don't want to daydream, that's for sure. Corn farms 
can be as large as 2,000 acres or bigger. And so that's about the size of 20 Vatican cities. But it's not just the size. At stake with every harvest are billions of dollars and potentially millions of lives. The challenge? To pick the more than 68 million acres of the U.S. dent corn crop. So how do farmers do it? Not by hand, that's for sure. Instead, they call in their secret weapon, a monster machine called a combine. During the harvest season, when time is limited, we need to get our crops off in a hurry. It takes around 120 to 200 man hours to harvest one hectare of field corn by hand, whereas a combine can perform an equivalent amount of work anywhere from a half to just over an hour. A top-of-the-line model like this can cost as much as $400,000. It can also cut, shuck, and shell more than 200 acres a day. Oh, that's a six-cylinder John Deere diesel, and it, it's like 120 horsepower. It's got a turbocharger on it, the engine housed. An entire farm's profits rest on the combine's ability to perform. And the tool taking the biggest bite is called the header. The corn comes in four rows at a time through the head. It's picked up by the gathering chains. And then the snapping rolls snap the ear of corn off the stalk. But the combine doesn't just cut the ears. Its powerful machinery can turn a stalk of corn into a blast of golden kernels in seconds. The ears slam into a rotating drum that shakes the kernels from the cob. An auger then lifts the loose kernels into a hopper for shipping. Every truckload is gold. With corn prices at record highs, each acre harvested can be worth $1,000. Plastic is everywhere. People do not realize that we are living in a plastic society where everything is done from plastic. From the fabrics of our clothing, to our glasses, to our watches, to the cars that we're driving. Most plastic today is oil-based. Not only does it use 10% of our oil supply, it increases global warming and can take more than 1,000 years to degrade. Plastics are everywhere. They're in landfills, they're in the ocean, they're floating around. But corn can change all that. Plastic made from corn is different. It's biodegradable, carbon neutral, renewable, and even edible. You're growing molecules out there, and we can arrange those molecules to be food or the plastic bag that the food comes in. At a time where we're starting to talk about, very seriously, about global warming, greenhouse gases, I believe that bioplastic are the great answer to the questions that we currently have. But how do you turn a kernel of corn into a clear sheet of plastic wrap? You've got to get down to the starch. What we want to do in wet corn milling is take these kernels apart into their components. Starch, protein, fiber. Steeping kernels in sulfur dioxide and water at more than 100 degrees loosens bonds within the kernel. After two days, the kernels are ready to be ground. If we do it just right, the germ will pop out and will start to float. And it floats because it has vegetable oil in it. Next, the mixture is centrifuged to pull the corn oil away from the starch. What's left is almost pure starch. The long chains of carbon molecules in the cornstarch are remarkably similar to the chains of carbon in oil-based plastics. Turning them into a plastic just takes a few secret ingredients, some citric acids, and some mixing. And bingo! You've got a long chain polymer, the building block for plastic. Six weeks ago, this was corn on a cob. All of a sudden, it's a plastic. Now these pellets of corn polymer can be melted and formed into all kinds of biodegradable plastic products. What used to be a corn grain is now a fork. And that's pretty incredible.
Before advanced high-yielding hybrids, farmers all over the country grew many types of corn. It was less efficient, but safer, because even if one type of corn was attacked by disease or pests, other types were resistant and would survive. But now, to maximize yield, U.S. growers rely on just a few strains. We don't have as many farmers growing this diversity in these various areas of the world anymore. That means the entire crop is especially vulnerable. Because it's genetically identical, a single pest or pathogen could exploit a genetic weakness and ravage the harvest, threatening the world's supply. If it's virulent enough and the crop is uniform enough, it could wipe out a crop in a year. This could lead millions of people around the world to starvation. But there is a defense. The Insects and Crop Genetics Research Unit in Ames, Iowa. This federal facility stores more than 20,000 different varieties of corn seed. Each kernel offers a reservoir of genetic diversity designed to help scientists and breeders save crops from biological disaster. We're trying to make sure that genes that evolved over the course of the evolution of that material aren't lost. They might be useful in the future to fight um, some disease that might come on, some insect. When a pest or disease attacks, researchers go to the vault. They look for a variety that long ago evolved a resistance to a specific pathogen and then breed that resistance into a current crop. We can actually go back to the seed banks, pull out the old varieties, look for uh, ones that are resistant to whatever problems that we're having at the time, and so it basically saves our food stuff. As corn's enemies mutate and advance, the role played by these seed banks becomes increasingly critical. They aren't just preserving corn's past, they're also protecting its future and ours. The River Valley Co-op in DeWitt, Iowa, home to one of the world's largest piles of corn. Yeah, it's just a lot of corn. When this pile was full, it had just short of a million bushels in it. This storage facility holds enough corn to provide more than 25 million people enough calories to live for a day. Just one of these steel bins can hold an incredible five square miles of corn. But there's so much corn grown each year that even these giant bins are quickly filled. We market this grain all year long. We're loading into trucks and transporting either to an ethanol plant or to a river terminal and loading it on a river barge to be transported either to a different part of this country or around the world. Corn storage may seem safe, even dull, but it's not. Every bin and silo can literally become a powder keg. All it takes is a little bit of grain dust. Grain dust is highly explosive. When new loads pour into the bins, this kicks up dust, a mix of cornstarch and corn oil that's combustible when suspended in air. With its high carbon content, the starch is extremely flammable, and the oil can accelerate the blaze even more. It's more explosive than dynamite if you have the right concentration of grain dust in the air plus a spark. We have video just into our newsroom. Firefighters from at least five area departments were on the scene trying to douse the flames. Over its 21-week growing cycle, the U.S. Dent corn crop converts sunshine, water, and CO2 in the air into more than 412 billion pounds of starch. Starch is what fuels the conversion of corn into an incredible source of power. It's really all about the starch. But in Tennessee whiskey, America's unique contribution to alcoholic beverages, this starch is more than just a source of energy. It's what makes Tennessee whiskey, Tennessee whiskey. Of 
Corn is very important. We buy roughly about six million bushels of grain. Five of it's gonna be corn. So it's, it's king. Here at Jack Daniels in Lynchburg, Tennessee, they only use number one yellow corn, a type of dent corn. It's considered a very nice, healthy kernel that stores well, that has a high starch content. Of course, the trick to turning those millions of kernels into gallons of whiskey is to free the starch. To do that, the corn flows into a mill where a series of metal bars called hammers crush the pericarp. It'll fall into the hammer mill and these hammers will then basically explode the grain against these, these screens. The corn is then sifted and blown into a 10,000 gallon mash cooker. There, the crushed cornstarch is mixed with other grains and Jack Daniel's secret ingredient, iron-free cave water. That's good because iron inhibits fermentation. Next, the corn and cave water soup is cooked at 220 degrees, turning the cornstarch into concentrated sugars. It helps to solubilize those starches, get them into the cave water, get them onto some a format that the, that the yeast can actually go and attack and, and convert to alcohol. And this is the key. Sugars in corn are the perfect food, not just for people, but for a very specialized creature, yeast. Yeast is a single-celled fungus, and yeast is able to, in the absence of oxygen, break sugar down into ethanol and carbon dioxide. Inside these 40,000 gallon fermentation tanks, the corn undergoes a complete transformation. Billions of tiny yeast cells devour the solar energy stored in the kernel as starch. This mixture is slowly boiled or distilled to remove the water and create 140 proof, or 70% corn alcohol. Alcohol boils off at a lower temperature than the water, so it, uh, it turns into a gas and then you can later collect it through a condensing column with water running through it and it uh, drips down and becomes alcohol. This clear, flammable liquid is then filtered to remove impurities. Next, it gains its color by aging in an oak barrel, where corn alcohol finally becomes genuine Tennessee whiskey. There are lots of kinds of corn, but none is as fun or packs the high pressure wallop of popcorn. How does it do it? It's all about the shell. What makes popcorn unique from the other types of corn is the hard outer shell. It has to be strong and it has to be airtight. This sealed shell is the key to popcorn's amazing power. It has to be able to hold back the pressure inside the kernel until the temperature reaches at least 450 degrees Fahrenheit. That's when steam in the endosperm gelatinizes the starch and presses out against the pericarp. Once the kernel starts to go past 450 degrees, it redlines. The pressure within each kernel can be as much as 135 pounds per square inch. To put that in perspective, most car tires can hold about 90 pounds of pressure before exploding. There is so much pressure exerted from the expanding moisture against that outer shell that literally the corn turns inside out and the white fluffy part of uh, popcorn is, is starch. But tapping that power means getting just the right kernels and avoiding the duds, which is what they do at Jolly Time Popcorn in Sioux City, Iowa. Every day, the company trucks in 160 million kernels per load. So, what does it take to make the perfect kernel for popping? The answer is a thick rounded shell with the right amount of moisture inside. It pops best at 13.5% moisture, so our first job as a processor is to dry that corn to the proper moisture content. Getting the moisture level right is the easy part. Moisture determines the kernel's weight. The kernels too dry to pop are shaken out by a specialized device. We call the gravity machine, and a lighter kernel is probably light because it's lost its moisture and therefore won't pop well, so we eliminate that as well. The hard part is making sure the kernel itself isn't damaged. 
But how do you do that on a line where more than 750,000 of the tiny kernels race by every minute? That's too fast for the human eye to catch defects. So the popcorn is zapped with all-seeing ultraviolet light. If the light sees a discolored kernel, then a shot of air will blow it off the line and eliminate it. Those that pass inspection fire into bags at a rate of 950 kernels every second. It's very confusing at times, but it's a lot of fun. It's chaotic. 200,000 pounds a day and nearly a million pounds a week travel from Jolly Times Corn Crib to popcorn bowls around the world. And each of them is a tiny steam-powered bomb, just perfect for munching. Americans might eat a lot of popcorn, about 54 gallons per family per year, but we use a lot more gas. In fact, we use about 146 billion gallons of gas every year. But did you know that about 6 billion of those gallons don't come from underground? Instead, they come from this, corn. And this Vera sun plant in Charles City, Iowa is a big part of that equation. Turning hard kernels of corn into a clear, flammable fuel takes some doing, though. First, you need a lot of corn. Today, we're going to get about 320 truckloads, or almost a little over 300,000 bushels. Then the corn is crushed, steeped, and pumped into 800,000 gallon tanks. There, it meets a special yeast, one that loves nothing better than eating the starch in the corn and transforming it. The fuel ethanol industry could take an equivalent amount of, of grains and starch and convert it within, say, 50 to 70 hours. We always try to maximize that to get as much as we can from that corn so we don't waste any of the starch. Every day, the refinery turns bushels of plain old dent corn into 200 proof, 100% corn alcohol. Basically, it's moonshine. I mean, really, that's, that's ultimately what we're making here, but it, you really wouldn't want to drink it. Of course, 100% pure ethanol packs a lot of energy enough for Henry Ford to run his first car on the stuff. Ethanol's fast-burning flame is almost invisible to the naked eye. A single stray spark could cause a conflagration. When your alarm starts going off, you have to shut everything down. To avoid accidental combustion, cell phones are forbidden inside the facility because they can spark and ignite fumes. And all employees wear specially designed cotton jumpsuits that won't melt to their skin in the event of a fire. But despite the dangers, day in and day out, this facility produces 300,000 gallons of pure ethanol fuel. And the demand continues to grow. It's growing and new, and there's always new technologies uh, just on the horizon, and we're going to continue to, to capitalize on those new opportunities. Even as ethanol plants spring up across the Midwest, questions still remain. Is it efficient to make fuel from corn? Is it really a way to energy independence? And at what cost? Corn has these incredible uncounted prices. Uh, the fertilizer being, you know, probably the most important. All that, it takes an immense amount of fertilizer that is derived from natural gas, from fossil fuel. And that's not counting the gas to harvest and transport the corn or manufacture the ethanol. So what it means is that it takes a lot of gas to turn corn into gas. But one amazing difference between ethanol and gasoline is that when you burn ethanol, you get water. That's right, when ethanol combines with oxygen in your engine, it makes water. The temperature sits at more than 90 degrees with humidity to match. It's the beginning of the sweet corn harvest. Farmers wait for the right moment. When it's ready, you've got to chop it. Then start cutting. The timing is real crucial here. When you have to work, you have to go. Lexington, South Carolina. The farmers here face a unique challenge at harvest time, one that comes from corn's remarkable diversity. 
Corn is the most versatile commodity that we have in agriculture. They're actually better raw than they are cooked. Sweet corn is a mutant that occurred thousands of years ago in the evolution of corn when it was being domesticated, and uh, it retains a juicy, sweet nature. But this unique trait makes harvesting sweet corn a perilous task. Timing is everything. One day too long on the stock, and the sugar decays, losing its sweetness. If you leave them on there too long, they actually turn to starch. To stop the clock, workers must harvest the crop in just hours. On average, a team can clear 10 acres and package more than 208,000 ears per day. But it's not just about harvesting quickly. To keep that corn sweet and tasty, you need some emergency measures. Ice which is why every 30 minutes, the truck returns with loads of corn bound for the ultimate in cool downs, the hydro cooler. Once you cut it, it you, gotta, you have to take the field temperature out of it. If you don't cool it down, it'll just continue to heat up. The summer sun that helped the corn grow is now its enemy. Heat speeds up the breakdown of the sugar, so chilling sweet corn from 50 degrees to just above 32 degrees Fahrenheit reduces sugar loss by 400%. Within just two days of picking, an annual 2.5 billion pounds of this sweet, delicious corn hits backyard cookouts around the country. Corn might seem pretty simple. A big green stalk, some silky fibers, and hundreds of kernels tucked into a cob. But looks can be deceiving. Corn affects everything. It's, it's become a uh, major player in almost everything we do. The complexities of corn are being plumbed in a high security lab buried more than 160 feet below the surface of the earth. The reason for the security? Try to imagine a world without corn. If we had zero corn, we wouldn't have the livestock. We wouldn't have a basic staple in our diet. We would have problems feeding ourselves. To keep their experiments and the rest of the world safe, controlled farming ventures put their research facility at the bottom of a sealed limestone cave. We designed our production system in response to a lot of the very valid concerns. Here, these scientists aren't just crossbreeding corn. They're literally building new kinds of corn, gene by gene. Geneticists and corn breeders are in a never-ending struggle to produce better limes. To do that, Researchers first had to decode the corn genome. Corn has more than 50,000 different genes. To put that in perspective, you have just 26,000. Corn contains almost twice as much genetic information as people. Plants, like corn, don't have the ability to move away from stressful environments. So if it's hot or there's a drought, if we're hot or we're thirsty, we go walk in the shade and we get a drink. The plant has to have within it genetic programming to deal with whatever stress it faces. So it needs more genes. This genetic richness makes corn's DNA easy to modify. Much of the work done here involves traditional goals, like increasing yields and protecting this vital crop from biological dangers. Should there be a worldwide problem with corn, whether it's from disease or insect infestation, we can help the development of treatments for that condition Corn scientists are pushing corn to be more than just a better plant. They're manipulating its individual genes to turn corn into a pharmaceutical factory. One day we hope to take what we've learned to develop a line of corn that's going to be able to save lives. Specifically, corn scientists are working on a treatment for the deadly genetic disease called cystic fibrosis that kills more than 450 people every year. You know, the corn plant is, is just going to be, you know, a lifesaver, literally, and, and even in that much higher end demand. One of the major issues faced by people with cystic fibrosis is that they lack a protein that allows them to digest fats and oils, and so they suffer from malnutrition. To produce a cystic fibrosis medicine, geneticists insert an isolated gene from a dog into corn's DNA. 
The hope is that this gene will cause the corn to produce a protein that can be used to treat the disease. Really, it can be anything. Any gene that you can splice into the corn plant and, and allow it to replicate itself and still harvest that, that product out at the end. Corn bred to fight cystic fibrosis isn't grown here yet, but this cave is the perfect place to mass produce genetically altered corn. This kind of genetic engineering offers astounding advantages, but also serious risks. What if a genetically modified future corn plant spread its pollen to other plants? Could it trigger a catastrophic chain of events? When you're messing around with experimental plants and, and, and you don't know how they're gonna affect any other organisms, um, then, then that's when the precautions really need to be taken to try to keep this stuff isolated and prevent it from getting out. Concerns are not entirely far-fetched. Other facilities have produced corn kernels that made their own pesticide, one that killed a common corn pest, the European corn borer. But there was a side effect. The toxin made its way into corn's pollen and killed other organisms unlucky enough to take a bite. The monarch butterfly. When the butterfly feeds on this genetically modified corn, it dies. So that is one big concern that people see and they say, well, if it's affecting the butterflies in this way, how is it going to affect me? There are also fears that the pollen of genetically modified corn could escape into the wild and combine with the existing crop, causing widespread destruction. Which is another reason that the research here takes place deep within this twisting labyrinth of limestone caverns. We are underground. The pollen would have to follow a path that's more mysterious than the Kennedy assassination bullet um, to get outside. Most consider the risks well worth taking. As we understand those processes, we will be able to re-engineer the corn plant to do whatever we want. It's incredible to think that it all revolves around the humble kernel of corn, that each seed of this grass is basically a way of storing energy from the sun in the form of starch, that every kernel is a tiny solar battery developed over 10,000 years of research and development, one that can be transformed into so much more, more food, more fuel, more possibilities. It's the germ, pericarp, and endosperm. One part contains the living genetic material of the plants where the DNA is, and that's what allows it to grow. Then around that is really a bunch of energy, which we would call starch. It's actually a solar power cell that turns the energy from the sun and takes in CO2 and turns it all into food or chemical energy. It really is just this, this packet of carbohydrate. Pound for pound, carbohydrates contain more energy than dynamite. Extracting that energy is the trick. Animal cells like ours do it by transforming the starch into a sugar called glucose, the main fuel source for every cell in our bodies. Glucose is sort of the building block of all life. But corn hasn't always provided us such an amazing source of energy. It's had to evolve. Everyone knows what corn looks like. As tall as a grown man, bright green, giant juicy cobs covered in golden kernels. And we all know where corn grows too, the Midwest. Well, it turns out neither one is really true. In fact, to find real corn, you need to go to central Mexico. The ancestor of corn is this uh, little branched grass in, in Mexico called teacinte. That's right, corn less corn crop is a type called dent corn, named for the little dent in each kernel. So why is this one type so dominant? Because no other food crop on earth produces so much so fast. We are now up to close to 200 bushels of corn per acre. It's an amazing amount of food. Five tons of food from one acre of land. It's an incredible achievement. It's true, but even though it's the biggest crop in the country and maybe the world, raw dent corn is pretty much impossible for humans to eat. They're growing inedible crops in a certain sense. I mean, they've gotta be processed first. That's because the outer shell is too hard for our bodies to digest. In fact, to make dent corn edible, 
It either has to be ground into flour or soaked in a highly corrosive alkaline substance called lye, the same chemical used to tan leather. But corn still makes up a huge percentage of all the calories we consume. Dent corn finds its way into everything from chips to ice cream to toothpaste. We wouldn't be here if it wasn't for corn. No, corn is a lifeline. To keep up with the world's demand for corn, American farmers grew a staggering 93.6 million acres last year. That's more than enough cornfields to cover every square inch of Iowa and Illinois combined. And every kernel from every ear of every stalk is loaded with corn's secret ingredient, a complex energy-packed molecule called starch. Corn is made up of three key components. It's America's iconic crop. It grows bigger and faster than any other grain in the world. Without it, the Aztecs, the Pilgrims, and the state of Iowa might not exist. And maybe we wouldn't either. There's so much you didn't know about corn, it will blow your mind. So let's find out how this crop works. Corn is the single most productive crop on the planet. Nothing, I mean, nothing grows as well as corn. You can't get the biomass, the yield of any other grain or, or vegetable product compared with corn. This ordinary seeming plant can be turned into everything from plastics to gasoline. It's a brilliant plant in its adaptability. It's used so profusely in so many products in so many ways I'm not sure we could live any longer if we lost corn. And corn is us. Up to 70% of the carbon in our bodies comes from this single incredible plant. But the kind of corn that makes up most of the U.S. harvest has a bizarre secret. One that will shock you. Ninety-nine percent of the U isn't a vegetable, it's a grass. And the cobs of that original plant are just slightly larger than a quarter, certainly not big enough for a meal. So how did this stubby little Central American grass turn into the giant green monster that crowds the fields of Iowa? People. This is a product of, of 10,000 years of domestication and now breeding to get this plant which is tall and produces these large ears of seeds. The man-made work of improving corn is still going on at Iowa State University, Ames, Iowa. And the pressure is on. Corn producers want to increase yields by 6% every five years. Luckily, corn is ready-made for selective breeding. It's a perfect plant. It's got both male and female flowers, and so it's the easiest plant to manipulate. We can take the pollen from another corn plant and mix it with the, the female parts and essentially take the best traits from two plants. One parent grows well in tight rows. The other produces large ears. Crossbreed them, and you might get a hybrid capable of generating more corn per acre. So right now, yields are going up in Iowa at about the rate of about two bushels per acre per year. Getting the corn plants to crossbreed may be easy, but finding a breakthrough hybrid requires a lot of trial and error. Like creating a new drug, breeding new corn varieties can take years of work and cost a fortune. The hybrid seeds that a farmer plants has millions of dollars of research behind it. And our symbiotic relationship with corn doesn't end in the breeding lab. Getting the man-made corn to grow isn't just a matter of scattering some seeds and hoping for the best. You pay for everyone, you won't plant everyone. Just getting the seeds in the ground is a roll of the dice. There's an old saying, you don't have to go to Vegas to gamble. You can do it by becoming a farmer. We have normally a narrow window due to weather concerns to get our crop planted. But it's not just the seeds themselves that are carefully designed by man. It's also how they're planted. In the wild, seeds are dispersed by winds or animals. On a corn farm, they're dispersed by high-tech equipment. 
Each one of these diesel-powered beasts pull planters some 60 feet wide and capable of spitting out 32,000 seeds per acre. If you calculate that, that comes out to about one seed every six inches. I'm checking my spacing right now. Apparently, we very close to six. Because every inch matters, some farmers even employ satellites 12,000 miles above the fields to guide their machines. By 